Welcome to Clive and Richard's Sensory Podcast. In this podcast or video, if you're watching it on YouTube, we want to talk about sensory rooms. We're going to do how do you build them? How do you make them? What sort of equipment should you have? What kind of colours do you need in there? And most importantly, what do you actually do in a sensory room? Because that has been a big issue just lately. People expect the equipment to do it all, but it doesn't. And we're going to tell you why. So I'm Richard Hurstwood. And oh gosh, I got involved in sensory rooms, late 80s, early 90s. 1995, I wrote this book called The Practical Guide to Multi-Sensory Rooms. And now I've got a brilliant job just as an advisor in education working all over the world. And uh, oh, I get to work hands on after COVID. I get to work hands on with kids, with young adults, and I have an absolute ball. My name's Clive Smith, and I've been working in the field of special needs for way, way too long, uh, going so far back. So I've got loads of experience of working with every sort of special needs. I first got involved in sensory rooms after meeting this uh, certain guy that you've been hearing from, Richard Hurstwood, back in uh, 1990, uh, and quickly got really into using sensory rooms. And I too have had the great uh, experience of being able to see schools all over the country, uh, seeing the best practice, seeing some practice that's maybe not quite so good, and being able to come up with lots of ideas about why we need these sensory rooms. Do you know if there were two books that started all this off? It was, yeah, all right, mine maybe in 1995, but earlier than that was Snoozeland, Another World. And you know, this is a book about sensory rooms or Snoozeland rooms, as they're often called in other parts of the world. This book was up absolutely fantastic and you know it is in this day and age it really is worth another read it was first published in 1987 but you know if you think about mindfulness you think about relaxation you think about how we're considering the mental well-being of many of our learners whatever age this book, I think, touches a lot on that. It was published by Romper, which, yeah, they're a commercial company. But, yeah, although it's all plus for sensory rooms in snooze, and it's worth a read. Mine was published by a sensory company as well, so that's all plus about sensory rooms. Are we right? Well, in this podcast, you are going to find out. Are we right or are we not? Maybe we're not. So, sensory rooms came around in the 1980s, back when I was a, a special effects man making all sorts of stuff, and Clive was wading his way into the amazing realms of special education. Do you know there was a reason why we realised that sensory rooms were needed in schools? And I do think it's something that we maybe need to be reminded of these days, because lots of people these days are saying, oh, we don't need a sensory room. We can just do it in the classroom. Oh, we can just use this portable one. And yeah, do you know what? There are many reasons why we'd want to do that. But a sensory room is an amazing space. It's a classroom. It's a playroom. It's a relaxation room. It's whatever kind of room we want it to be. And I think that is the strength that a sensory room has. Yes, I totally agree with the uh, with the, those qualities that a sensory room can bring to working with our students. My experience has always been that a well set up sensory room creates an environment where our students really do settle into the experiences and the stimuli that we're going to present with them. Uh, they feel they're almost in a, a safe environment. And so the work that we can do with our students within there, and it is work because we are uh, practitioners working with the students, is much more pr productive than it may be in many of the other environments that we find ourselves using. Some people, and some people we're interviewing, interviewing on the uh, Chris and Richard Autism podcast, some people hate sensory rooms. Some of our learners hate sensory rooms. And sensory rooms are definitely not for everybody. But you know what? For the learners who enjoy them, they are a fantastic place to learn. And Paul Pagliano, in one of his many books that he wrote about sensory rooms and snoozlem rooms, he's from the University or was from the University of Cookstown. He wrote some amazing books, and they're really worth looking up. 
He said to me, he said, a sensory room is a place where we can control the stimulus. And I think that's really important, being able to control the stimulus. In other words, increase the stimulus, decrease the stimulus, use it in isolation or use it in combination with something else. A sensory room is controllable to the degree that you can actually do that. Many of our uh, students that we're working with have been brought into a world that is full of sensory experiences. Yet quite a lot of the students, the children that we'll work with, have what might be termed an irregular sensory profile. We're not sure how they're responding visually, auditory, uh, or tactilely to some of the stuff around them. Many of our students will just accept all the sensory input around them. But for some of our students, we need to understand and get to grips with what their sensory profile is, what their likes are, what their strengths are. What are the things that they dislike? What are the things that are going to upset them? And sensory work is a place where we can start to begin to build up that profile of the students. And to be able to do it properly, we need, as Richard said, to be able to control the sensory environment. And that's why I feel that sensory rooms are so important. This makes them a great place for sensory assessment, simply because you can control that stimulus coming in so we can cut out a lot of the visual clutter remember when you go into a sensory room the last thing we want you to do is switch everything on it's a little bit like trying to use a screwdriver a spanner a sewing machine and drink a cup of tea at the same time you're not going to be able to do it you need to just turn on one thing or maybe two things that you're actually going to use that way you can really get some good assessment scenarios there if you're looking at vision if you're looking at hearing touch anything like that also in a sensory room we don't get those interruptions we don't get those oi can you just do this for me you know in a sensory room it tends to be a hallowed place where if the sign is on the door we'll tend to say don't go in there because uh, they're doing a session that's brilliant so for assessment i think it's great helps us to cut down this bombardment scenario which i should say we always think of that as people who have autism or are autistic. But believe me, a lot of our PMLD learners and more moderate learners uh, really do get bombarded by too much sensory stimulus. But it goes the other way as well. You know, they may be really sensory seeking some sensory stimulus. And if it's tactile and vision, maybe the bubble tube is going to be the thing that they want to really grab hold of. So I'm quite clear that uh, if you've got a sensory room, if the sensory room is well set up. And by that, I don't mean that it's absolutely ram jam full of every latest bit of sensory equipment. I mean, it has some basic elements that we'll probably talk about in uh, later on, but there is space for the child, the space for you. It's easily accessible. There's a lack of interruptions. And then it's an area where we can start to learn about the child that we're working with, learn about the student. The student can start to learn about us. We can begin to develop that relationship. And when we're happy within that relationship, so much more will come out of the learning experience. We can use the sensory room. We can use some of the basic sensory equipment to enhance the student's learning. We can add on to some of the practices that we're we're already using in the classroom, but we can make them more effective, more interesting, more stimulating. We can also, as I've said, increase the effects that we're having from that sensory input. We can exaggerate it. And maybe for some students, we might want to reduce it. We might want to bring it right down. We might want to make as little noise as possible so that we're making them focus on what is available. The sensory room is a place where we can control it all, as Richard said, and we can really begin to focus one-to-one -one on the student that we're working with. The other thing we should say about sensory rooms is if you look around most of them, we've got, as you can see here, you know, we've got amazing bubble tubes, we've got fiber optics, we've got all sorts of amazing expensive equipment. But don't just think about using the expensive equipment. What you've got to do is take a learner into the room, young or old, and find something they like. 
Now, the start of that might be actually taking something in that they like. They may have a, a favorite octopus or they may have a favorite spinner that you need to take into the room to actually get somebody settled and accustomed to the room. And remember, when you take somebody in a room, give them time at the beginning of your session just to get used to the space. Don't take them in with everything on it. When we talk about design, I'll talk about dimmers in sensory rooms. In other words, we're not just going to go in and go bang, big white light out, boom, the special effects lighting on. Take in your little sensory stuff because do you know what? Doesn't matter how much it costs, it could be one pound, one dollar, a million dollars, or a million pounds. It's down to the learner whether or not that thing works. So it isn't just expensive things. I don't think that they're going to work. It is about you and the student, not the equipment. Let's get that really straight from the start. The most important piece of equipment that is in the sensory room is yourself. Is you knowing why you're in the sensory room, what your time there is for, what you're hoping to get out of the work in the sensory room. Also, if you spend that time there you get to know the materials the equipment that you're working with you get to know your student you begin to understand the you know the, the likes and the dislikes the strengths and the needs of that student you're then able to pick up on the little cues that allow us to do what we're there for to to educate the child to to pick up on a just a little glance to one side, a little nod that means there may be some communication. And you will then be able to just take that and move on with it and to really start to pull out those skills from the student that you're working with. You know, here at Hurstwood Training, we've got a lot of wacky ideas on my YouTube channel and things like that. But if you want a really good resource or a really good person to look for resources, Flo Longhorn, Flo's books are all online and you can download them for free. They're old, but you know what? Like us too, they're still useful. They're absolutely fantastic. Flo's books, sensory literacy, mathematics. Uh, there's real sensory, real, she's covered everything. And they're all down. I'll put them into a link uh, so you can actually get to those because they are amazing. One of the things you need to be really aware of with that absolute wealth of material out there is where do I go? You, what do I do? Where do I start? You really need to have your own route map. Uh, you can have all these ideas. There are, there's so many in Flo Longhorn's material. There's so many in all the work that's around. But don't take these as a sort of a checklist of things that you need to work through. They are something that guides you to, to develop in, okay, I'm going to use that word, an assessment of the student that you're working with. Now, assessment isn't, to me, it isn't about ticking boxes. It isn't about, yes, he can do this on a scale of one to five, or she can do that on a scale of you know one to five, whatever. It is about just simply getting to know your student get to know the student you're working with, begin to build up that sensory profile of that student. Know that if you want to really start communicating, these are the things that the child really wants to hold, to explore, to handle. And we can use those to develop our communication skills. Or we can use the same equipment for a whole other uh, development of areas such as you know joint action giving and taking but once we all those things will come from knowing the student knowing what their likes are and the sensory room is the great place to find that out so i think what we've got to do is ask the question what is a sensory room obviously there are sensory rooms like this one which cost tens of thousands of pounds but there are many other places you can create sensory rooms and they don't have to be as expensive as this. You know, a sensory room uh, could be a part of a classroom. But I think if you're going to make a sensory room part of a classroom, you need to make sure that a lot of the learners in the classroom can't see it, can't get inside it, can't really access it. Uh, to the point that it's going to distract them so much that they won't be able to focus what's going on in the classroom. And many open sensory areas in classrooms 
can be very distracting for a lot of our learners. I think Clive will agree, you know, a classroom is a brilliant place for a sensory space. Yes, absolutely. I mean, every classroom that you go into, uh, just by the fact that there's all these things in it, there's all these uh, displays on the wall, there's materials around, is a sensory experience. Uh, what we have to be aware of is that for some of our students, and quite often, particularly those on the, the autistic spectrum, they have come into school with a whole sensory profile and they are going to have things that they don't like. When we talk to uh, our friends who uh, identify themselves as big on the autistic spectrum, the one thing that they say to us that they really have problems with is sensory overload, is too much sensory input. And so we've got to be aware of that. Now, classrooms are fantastic sensory spaces. And part of our work is to help our students understand and make the most of those sensory areas and we can do this by having particular locations where we we just reduce the amount of sensory input we make the the sensory experience a little calmer and so we can we can then add to it we don't cause a a sensation that is problematic for our students so a sensory room maybe doesn't have to look like this it could be part of a place in a classroom or maybe it's just a room that you've managed to commandeer for another hour or so and you know if you've got portable equipment then things like this can be wonderful a good idea is often to just get a little toolbox like this this is from black and decker i think oh stanley and you see in there i've got all my sensory stuff that i can just pull out of the box this is for storage of screws and things like that. The lovely thing about this is that you can see what's inside. So you can just go and grab it very quickly when you're working. A sensory room could be in a tent. It could be under a big umbrella. It could be absolutely anywhere. It doesn't have to be big, expensive stuff. It can be some cheaper stuff. And we're going to cover that in future podcasts because I think it's important knowing what kind of equipment and knowing the differences between cheap and expensive things because sometimes uh, expensive doesn't work sometimes cheap doesn't work one of the main things you've got to do with a, a sensory space is think about it as anywhere you see uh, wow sensory rooms outside can be absolutely fantastic. You know, we tend to look at a lot of tactile effects and a lot of vestibular and proprioception when we're thinking about sensory outside. And, you know, we'll have maybe, yeah, there's a lot of tactile things already, already exist. And in a future podcast, we'll probably talk about sensory gardens, but creating just wonderful tactile experiences. This can be great fun outside. There's a lot of visual things you can put outside as well. The sun is a wonderful light source. Not that we have that much in the UK, but nevertheless, New Zealand and Australia, you've got loads of it. And it can be brilliant. The outdoor spaces are it's fantastic. I think that we've really got to grasp the, the whole concept of sensory. We're talking about sensory rooms, and Rich has just been talking about, you know, the sensory experiences in the outdoor world. We can take our students into that outdoor uh, world and we can work with them and do everything out there that we can do within the classroom, a smaller area. But we've got to be very clear again about what we're trying to do with it, why we're, why we're there, uh, what are we looking for in the outdoor world when we're working there with the students, uh, and that all comes from that sensory profile that I've been talking about to be able to build that up and say, well, this child loves uh, making noise, loves banging things together, loves the experiences that come from that. And what we, where do we want to take that from? We want to use that as maybe a form of communication, maybe a form of music making, just maybe a form of personal expression. Once we begin to think that, yeah, let's get outside. Let's get those pots and pans out there. Let's get some noise makers. Uh, so wherever we're going to work, we've always got to work to with a purpose. We've always got to understand why we're there. 
what we're doing it for. And then we can make the most of every short minute that we have with our students. But of course, that doesn't mean that it doesn't, oh, it's not going to be fun. When we think about sensory rooms at home, maybe the emphasis is going to be different at home. It's going to be more about relaxation. It's going to be more about occupation. It's going to be more about sharing those moments, you know, and I think a sensory room at home may not have the educational bias that we have in a school, but a sensory room at home will create the same opportunities and it will again help us focus and concentrate. You know, your, your, your son, your daughter, it will really help them or could if they like sensory equipment, it could really just help us with transitions like bedtime, meal time, those kind of moments where we maybe just need a little bit of distraction just to take us from there to there. Maybe we've just come in from school and we've been in the minibus and we're a bit hyper. Then we might need a space where Alexa doesn't interrupt and tell me it's time to finish the podcast, but we may need a space Alexa, where we stop. can... Yes, we can just go... We may need a space where we can just go, oh. So sensory rooms are about many things. And in future podcasts, we'll be looking at design. We'll be looking at equipment. We'll be looking at use with difficult and challenging behavior. We'll be looking at autism. We'll be looking at sensory loss. Lots of different areas where we know, because we've done it, that sensory rooms really, really work. To, to finish this, our... Our senses, our sensory skills are our doorway to the world that we're going to live in. Uh, and we've got to make sure that if we're educating our children, our pupils, our students to live in that world, that they they have the sensory skills to be able to to function. Uh, it's it's inconceivable maybe to the likes of us that actually looking at things that hearing things that touching things could create a sense of anxiety but for some of our students that is the reality and we've got to use our skills to provide them with a safe and exciting introduction to the world out there through developing their sensory skills so that's it for this week. Look out in about seven days. Clive and Richard's Sensory Room podcast. Uh, we'll be back. And if you're watching it on YouTube, you've got some of the visuals as well. So thanks very much for listening. And we'll catch you in a week or so.